Thank you, Peter. Um, thanks very much for having me. Um, this is fun. Good afternoon. Uh, you try going after the guy who invented giving a shit about design on the web. Um, <laughs> so, I get a, as Peter mentioned, uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, data visualization. Um, I spent all my time thinking about numbers and, stu and such. Uh, I last lived in uh, San Francisco in the Bay Area uh, about 12 or 13 years ago and um, was working as a, uh, an interface designer at, at Netscape. Uh, may they rest in peace. Um, and I was uh, basically had grown up um, interested in design and computer science as sort of separate, separate things since being fairly young. And, um, I figured that you know UI design was kind of the way to uh, you know use those powers for good, um, sort of save people from these awful computers, uh, and make software easier to use and and more tractable and such. Um, I was at Netscape for a bit and then left. Uh, what as they began imploding, um, and I went to uh, the Media Lab at MIT, and um, one of my first projects when I. Um, when I got to MIT, I was actually looking at um, sort of UIs that actually hate people. Um, so, you know, basically as a, a cathartic way of kind of getting all this, um, trying to help people, UI designer stuff out of my system, um, instead, this painting software that each of the colors actually had a different behavior, um, sort of clear that, uh, and, and sort of an antagonistic painting program. So I'm trying to draw a line. You know, the, uh, the yellow, it's actually only going to show me the mark before the mark that I'm drawing now. Um, this one, it's, you know, we're sort of upside down. Thank you very much. Um, or here, we're actually just erasing. And so, uh, yes, thank you. Um, you know, you've always wanted, as, as designers, you've always wanted to add this button to your software, I would assume. Um, but this was very cathartic, and this was nice to kind of, um, Get out, of, uh, get out of my system. Um, I do, as a, as a designer, uh, I began working sort of in design, doing graphic design work. Um, you know, we do these information graphics, you know, sort of tens and hundreds of data points, something you can actually sit down with Adobe Illustrator and lay out all by hand. Uh, and then moving, you know, once you add code, once uh, it kind of becomes this data visualization thing of, you know, thousands and probably millions of data points that you're trying to um, explain to people. And so, um, part of the wonderful job security in this is that we'll never actually have less data. You know, so there is no going back. Everyone talks about like there's more data and more data, and we're, um, you know, the uh, average person has to deal with you know just uh, 16,000 billion terabytes, petabytes, whatever, uh, per day just in their newspaper, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's not going backwards, and so uh, it's this magnificent job security uh, for me. Um, but first, let's begin with a story about sort of looking at um, data. So. I really enjoy football. I actually really like football. Um, and that's not playing football, mind you. I'm not actually coordinated enough to throw a much less catch AF football. Um, but terrific th sort of thing to uh, watch because it's basically, um, you know, couldn't be more opposite from any of the work that I do as far as thinking about numbers and uh, images. I mean, look how much this guy is enjoying it. The ref there, right there, he's just like, he's ready to go. Um, one of the teams that I follow is this, is uh, University of Michigan. I grew up in uh, Ann Arbor. And uh, they have this you know, wide receiver, Mario Manningham, um, just kind of an idiot, kind of a loudmouth, kind of a, just not a great uh, person necessarily. And um, I was curious about, uh, you know, and so the thing about wide receivers is that these are the guys you're actually going to hear about in the, in the press, you know, so Terrell Owens making all kinds of noise, you know, wide, wide receiver. Uh, Chad Ochocinco, formerly Chad Johnson, who's number is 85, and so he changed his last name to Ocho Cinco. Uh, don't tell him that that's not actually 85 in Spanish, but, um, <laughs> you know, sort of these sort of loud mouth kind of, you know, characters. And so uh, one, I, one day I was reading about um, this story about Mario Manningham in particular, uh, and he had scored a six on the, uh, the Wonderlick test. And so the Wonderlick test is this thing um, and it's basically uh, an intelligence test. You know, a 20 on the Wonderlick means, um, you know, your average uh, intelligence, you know, sort of an IQ of about 100. It's a, uh, what is it, it's a 50 score test um, taken in 12 minutes. And so all football players, you know, so football players intelligence tests, those go together, right? Perfect. Um, 
So all football players take this as part of the uh, NFL combine, which is, you know, all of the, uh, the college players go and they do all of these, you know, various things. They run a, run a sprint, do some jumps, they uh, do all this stuff. And then after they've done all these uh, athletic things that they've been tested on, uh, then they sit down and takes this, take this uh, intelligence test, um, which is also like just kind of a wonderful picture. I picture like the, uh, you know, the, uh, an in, a great big class of lawyers sitting down and taking the bar exam, and, and then afterwards they go run a 5K. You know, and it's and it's not so much like does it make you a better lawyer any more than the intelligence test makes you a better football player, but it's, hey, it's one more data point, of course. Um, and so, I was curious about how that actually works across different positions, and so. On Wikipedia, there's a, a rundown of what the different scores are for uh, different positions. And so starting with a, uh, a diagram from Wikipedia, sort of do the basic design stuff and kind of clean things up a little bit. Um, here I just, you know, cleaned up the colors and the layout and all that and added the numbers to uh, each of the positions. Um, so guess who the 17s are out on the uh, outside here, our, our beloved wide receivers. Um, and so also, we then actually just size the, uh, size the dots based on uh, those numbers, and then actually we don't actually have to show the numbers anymore. We can actually just put the positions back in. So the wonderful sort of um, thing that comes out of this, so I've just taken this very simple set of numbers, just plotted it out, um, and what I can see is that QB, the quarterback there, uh, isn't actually the smartest guy in the field. It's actually the smartest guy is his center right in front of him, uh, and these two guys on the outside uh, who are basically most in charge of preventing him from getting killed. And so they have to adjust to a, you know, a large number of situations. Um, as opposed to the guys on, on this side, this, in red we have the, uh, the defense. Um, they just, you know, they're just programmed to kill. They just need to go and like, <laughs> go and attack and all that. And so, um, you know, this is a, a really fascinating sort of story. And I, I think it's, it's interesting to um, take data sets like this, and especially for an audience um, who's not necessarily even into this or, you know, hadn't necessarily heard of it, uh, but instead, how can you actually engage people um, you know, in data in, in ways like that? Uh, sometimes it's actually just nice to see the data. So this is all uh, 26 million road segments from the entire US. So just, just plot it out. Um, the wonderful thing that happens, you know, so the first is the obvious things of, you know, so here's Detroit and Chicago, and so we're get, things are gonna be exceptionally dense in that area. Um, here's the, the Bay Area, so you can kind of pick out San Francisco there and then moving down the Bay. Um, and the, the way that things change is it heads into the mountains. Uh, this is Kansas City, you know, so much more gridded. Uh, but my favorite, so here's the Appalachian Mountains, uh, and basically defined by the roads avoiding them. You know, so it's, I haven't actually done anything to include geography or anything like that. Instead, just showing the data actually brings that out. Like it actually just, you know, that um, this extra layer actually kind of pops directly out of the information and sort of. Um, just sometimes data will, uh, will kind of give that to you. Um, because I can't actually uh, get degrees nor clients doing um, football plots or uh, street maps, um, I do a lot of work in uh, genetic data. So my PhD work had to do with uh, genetics. Uh, one of the typical things you do with um, working with uh, DNA is, you know, we just want to see it. We want to be able to browse through it. We want to uh, find a particular region, study it, see what, uh, what sort of data is happening in that area. Uh, this is the UCSC genome browser. This is looking at um, 150 base pairs of DNA. This is 10,000. This is 600,000. And the thing um, about this, this is very typical of, um, you know, data-oriented uh, design is that, you know, you sort of treat everything as, well, it's a bunch of start and stop positions. It's all distance along a chromosome. So we can just... Um, you know, put these points on a line because, uh, you know, they're, they're developers and so they're thinking about it in terms of, well, it's just a bunch of starts and stops and they've kind of gone up this level of abstraction instead of saying, well, how, people, how are people actually going to use that data? You know, so at 600,000 base pairs, do I actually need all of these elements? Like, what's, what's actually relevant on each of these parts? Um, and then, so, uh, you know, thinking I was, I was Mr. Smart Designer, um, I started with, uh, you know, so the, the powers of 10. So everybody in design class has seen, uh, you know, Charles and Reams' powers of 10, or even, you know, those of you who aren't designers, you've probably seen it. And so, you know, it's this wonderful thing. It's, you know, you're moving through orders of magnitude. We can kind of zoom in. Um, and this is the story of working with the genome, right? That, 
you know, really when scientists are um, dealing with it, you know, you start out at three billion base pairs of DNA. They're gonna do most of their work with about half a million to a million base pairs. You need to be able to zoom in to about 50,000 base pairs of, of, you know, these base pairs, just these letters of A's and C's and G's and T's. And you also need to get all the way from, you know, that one million scale down to individual letters. So I said, great, you know, I'll just kind of build out this, um, this browser that actually lets you, you know, sort of zoom through this information. And so um, here it is actually uh, up and running. You know, you can zoom in. Uh, you know, we're in a, on a particular gene now, and now it's kind of zoomed into an individual letters. Um, this is actually a terrible way to do a browser. Um, however, Nick Nolte uh, here is using it to figure out in uh, the movie The Hulk um, why his, his son keeps turning green and destroying buildings and, and so on. So, um, you know, for your average scientist, it's actually going to be a great deal of seasickness because you're sort of doing a lot of time, you know, sort of uh, going through these, order, these uh, layers of zoom. Uh, but in fact, uh, you don't actually learn anything from doing that, that zooming. And so instead, uh, a better solution is basically I want to... Uh, I want to see all of that information at the same time. I want to see the, the forest and the trees uh, simultaneously. So up at the top here, I've got these 600,000 letters. In the middle, I've got 10,000. And then down at the bottom, I have 160 individual base pairs. And what I've done is that up at the top, um, you know, this is my region of interest. I have a couple little tick marks that say something interesting is happening there. Uh, and I can hone right in. Uh, to you know, just one of these little tick marks all the way down to an individual letter um, that might be a, uh, the scientific term is a causative allele for selection um, as far as, uh, I'll, I'll spare you the uh, doing 18 minutes of a genetics lesson. Um, basic idea, you know, I want to be able to get through these, uh, these layers of detail, and I care about very different things on each of those, uh, those levels. Uh, this was a more advanced version uh, based on the same uh, browsing framework. Instead, here we're looking at uh, 12 different uh, mammals and how similar they are to, uh, to humans. So there's this fascinating stuff where basically, you know, these, uh, those pink, uh, you know, plots there, that's percentage of similarity from human all the way across chimp and dog and armadillo and et cetera. Uh, you know, so we have this amazing sort of level of similarity with all these other species. And so um, it's really quite interesting and fun to work with this data in this fashion. Um, so this is the tool version of it. And then this is, the, this is an illustration I did for a magazine uh, actually using that data. So uh, real data, you can sort of see that. Um, but instead, just something that, you know, looks more, just looks interesting, feel, kind of feels good, feels like DNA, sort of this sort of spatial kind of thing. Um, and this is one of the things I uh, try to do with my work in general is be able to move back and forth between, you know, these more practical things of, you know, sort of tools for scientists that um, allow you to really an analyze and work with the data. But on the other hand, you know, how can you, uh, you know, do things that are sort of more purely uh, visual or more, um, more evocative, more uh, sort of further out kind of things. And it's... Uh, it just winds up being helpful because if you do too much of one or the other that you kind of get stuck. Um, and this is a common thing that comes up, especially with, uh, you know, with data visualization work and, you know, to agree with um, design, this sort of, you know, balance of, you know, aesthetics and function and that they're treated as this sort of, you know, Cain and Abel type of, you know, battle between, you know, aesthetics and function and who's going to win out and all that. And so, you know, perhaps better we can uh, think about things as a bit, you know, more like a spectrum. So um, can we move back and forth? That, you know, the thing is that's not even that, um, that quite the right way to look at it, that it's, uh, you know, maybe more we can have like an axis or something. So, you know, we're further up the aesthetics axis on a particular piece, we're further over this way in the, the function axis, but they're not mutually exclusive, essentially. Um, but really, the, uh, the main takeaway, though, is you know, those aren't actually the things that are going to be most impactful on, on the uh, project itself. And so, you know, much more often it's going to be your audience uh, for whom the, the piece is created, you know, actual context of use, uh, you know, the time that you have to actually, you know, implement the project. Um, you know, so there are all these other factors that uh, are going to have a much greater impact in terms of um, the way people work with the, uh, the piece that you create um, and sunspots. Uh, another illustration, this is uh, looking at the, uh, the chimp. 
So uh, one of the main genes that's different bet between us and chimps is this gene called FOXP2. And uh, FOXP2 is believed to be uh, connected to language acquisition, that essentially that's one of the main differences between us and chimps. Uh, within that gene, it's about 72,000 letters of DNA. And there are just nine single letter positions uh, that account for the actual functional differences between us and chimps. You know, so among the three billion base pairs of DNA that we share with chimps, and amongst the 20,000 different genes that we all share, uh, within this one gene, there's this 75,000 letter you know, chunk of data, and of that, there are nine letters that may uh, essentially be the difference between us having language and uh, their language being significantly more primitive. And so this is a fairly simple, um, you know, so this uh, poster essentially shows, you know, all of those letters actually plotted out, and then it just highlights the different uh, locations where those take place. And so again, you know, so can you take this, um, this data set uh, or data sets like this and be able to tell uh, a story about what's, you know, what's actually in that information. Uh, and then this is, you know, back in the scientific tool side, this is the, uh, uh, this is the big boy version um, used by the scientists to actually track down uh, this type of uh, data within, you know, so this was a, a project I worked on with some collaborators at uh, MIT and Harvard, um, you know, basically as a way to uh, track down these different areas and try and find uh, regions that are under selection. Uh, so processing, um, one of the other uh, main goals of my, my own work is in uh, basically getting more people uh, creating things with code. So uh, to that end, uh, Casey Reese and I, and I have uh, started this project. It's uh, called Processing. It's a free and uh, open source programming environment. Um, the whole idea is to kind of make it easy to get up and running, making, uh, making visual things. Um, so this is processing. I can, you know, we wanted to be able to, you know, write a line of code and hit run and hopefully uh, something show up on the screen. And so, you know, or if I add a couple more lines, good God, he's coding in front of a bunch of designers. <laughs> um, so here, um, you know, very simple interactive thing. Uh, you know, this is just following the mouse. Instead, uh, let's see, let's set the fill to, I'm sorry, let's set the stroke to the mouse position divided by two. Let's change the stroke weight and so on. You know, so we shift the, uh, shift the color a little bit. And so what we wanted to do is get people up and running quickly with code and have a, um, you know, put all the, the fun stuff at the beginning so that um, later they can actually, uh, you know, once we have them hooked, that they can expand out into uh, other endeavors. Um, it's Java-based, uh, and I won't go through this whole slide, but the whole idea, it's freely available, Mac, Windows, Linux, you can download it from processing.org. Um, and we have a, a really wonderful set of uh, projects that have been created with it at processing.org slash exhibition. Um, I encourage you to, to check them out. That, I use it for visualization work, and then there's a lot of, uh, you know, Casey Reese uses it for interactive artworks, um, and then there's a, a whole range of things that people have done. Um, this is the, the growth of the project, uh, at least through this past February. Um, and so Casey and I have been doing this project, and this is sort of fun and also a bit terrifying um, as we look at, you know, sort of number of users per week. Actually using the software, we're at about 25,000 a week. Um, one of the terrific things that hops out of this data is that um, nobody likes to code in over Christmas. So here in January, um, you know, we have this uh, total downturn. And also, this sort of sloping thing that happens, this is heading into August, and then everybody comes back and it's, oh, September, time to actually work. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so this has been kind of fascinating to watch this, uh, this grow. There are a number of uh, books about the software. Um, most recently, Casey and I did a really small, uh, very basic book that we wanted to make it really easy for um, anybody to get started, have it be a really inexpensive book. Um, you don't make any money on books anyway. Um, that, uh, and actually, so I put this in to remind myself, but I have a, little, a bunch of little cards that O'Reilly gave me. Um, so you can get like the ebook for like $5 or you know, something like that. Um, I think this means I actually have to pay O'Reilly money rather than actually like 
you know, me actually making my nickel on it or something like that. But um, I encourage you to check it out because the whole um, the whole premise for this, you know, that uh, you know, Casey and I's uh, grand grand scheme, grand goal in all of this is that we're really trying to ruin your career. You know, we're trying to get more designers to actually start doing programming and more programmers to uh, start doing design work. Um, and we've actually been kind of successful with that, um, you know, with, with a few uh, cases. And it's really wonderful watching people kind of making this, uh, this transition and kind of working out different, um, different skill sets. Uh, let's see. A personal project. This is uh, looking at um, Charles Darwin's uh, Origin of Species. And so I got interested in this because a, a friend uh, who worked in genetics was telling me about the fact that uh, origin of species actually changed an enormous amount um, over the course of uh, Darwin's life. You know, so I went and uh, started looking into it, and that you know it went from about 150,000 words in the in the first edition that he wrote um, up to about 190,000 words uh, in the the sixth edition or the sixth English edition that he wrote um, before his death, and so. I like that. Uh, I think that's fascinating for a number of reasons. One is that um, you know we typically think of you know particularly outside of science, you think of like scientific ideas as these things that kind of you know so like well yeah uh, the uh, theory of evolution like Darwin went up on a mountain and he like figured it out and then he like brought clay tablets down and then like kind of gave it to science and then that's that's it evolution's figured out um, except for the um, American right uh, but the uh, but one of the things you know so instead we can actually see. Um, Darwin himself actually kind of struggling with these different ideas. So this is a basic uh, interactive viewer, loads in all, all six editions. You can see them over the left-hand side. Uh, blue is an addition, red is a uh, deletion. So basically here we have Darwin plus track changes. Um, so we can see, you know, just interactively kind of flip through the book and kind of get a sense of the types of things that uh, changed over time. The, uh, the final version instead looks something more like this. Um, where here I just wanted to show a, uh, a composite of the book for an, uh, for an exhibition. Um, so we start out with the entire text. So here's all 150,000 words um, done in a sort of half pixel font, um, just kind of greeked in. Uh, with the mouse, you can actually uh, read different portions of the text. Uh, and over time, it's simply adding these other additions to the, um, to the greeked portion up here. And so we can actually, uh, once this is, uh, built, has uh, finished its animation, uh, we can see, you know, for any given word where that actually came from and what the, uh, the provenance of that was. And, you know, so we can pick out things like, you know, so one of the things that Darwin ran into trouble with was he didn't actually, um, he didn't talk about God enough in the, uh, the first edition, and so this was a um, considerable point of uh, concern uh, given the, you know, sort of attitudes of the day. And so we can see in the first edition where he said, you know, uh, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having, originally, uh, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that was the planet, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in the uh, second edition, in that closing paragraph, he adds this extra, by the creator, you know, so like he can actually kind of cover himself a little bit in terms of, you know, how people were feeling about, you know, this uh, theory of evolution that kind of seemed to leave God out of the whole equation as far as who was making what and who is responsible for the, uh, the incredible variation you see between you know, different uh, plants and animals and so on. Um, actually, we'll move on. This is, uh, this is online on uh, my site. You can actually check it out there um, with a little bit more time. Um, let's see here. So uh, backing up a little bit, this also brings, brings to mind a certain process of how you develop this sort of work. You know? So as far as uh, starting with data, what typically happens is that you know, I have this pile of information. You know, I need to be able to uh, acquire it, parse through it, filter it, mine it. Um, you know, so this is kind of the computer science and math side of things. And then it gets kind of thrown over to the wall to people doing graphic design and interaction design and visualization and that sort of thing. And instead, this is a terrible way of actually working with information because of the way that each of these different parts actually inform one another. Um, typically in practice, uh, I'll start by, you know, sort of jumping through a couple of these steps. 
uh, you know, so for instance, doing that initial piece with the sort of Darwin and track changes. Um, but then once you've done that, you kind of work backwards and say, well, what's the question? What's, what's the story that you can actually pull out of this? Um, and then once you've done that, uh, the important part is this iteration step of, you know, the interaction, the way the interaction work is going to affect how you do the data mining portion and so on. And so basically you can't really separate these things. And so um, really trying to look at things sort of a, you know, from have a data set to uh, how we actually understand it. Um, and this is a data set. Uh, so this is uh, looking at some healthcare data. This was a client project for um, GE. Uh, this here, um, you think this is fascinating, but it actually goes on for another 160 columns, which gets better, um, and then six million rows. Um, and so it's, you know, it's uh, typically what you do is you kind of look at data like this, and there's a tendency to say, okay, how do I make a picture of it instead of, you know, kind of what's the, uh, what's the story? What am I trying to actually say about the data? Why did we collect it? And then working back to the actual piece. Um, this was the piece that we created for them. Uh, basically, it's a uh, six million patient records uh, from their electronic medical record database. Uh, and, and this is what it looks like, you know? So of all of the people in the database, 97% do not have heart disease, 3% do. 1% uh, have had a stroke. That's the breakdown on smoking. Um, and so very quickly, you know, so this doesn't feel like six million. We can actually um, get through the data in a very fluid way, um, but also it gets more interesting when we actually start comparing things. So one of the things about uh, various conditions is that they don't actually happen in isolation. So it's all about correlations and comorbidities and things like that, um, but you can't say that. And so instead, how can you actually demonstrate that to people and get them to start working with it? So here highlighting uh, diabetes, you can see how in the database, 4% uh, of people who have uh, a normal body mass index have diabetes, and that rapidly goes up to 26% of the people who are uh, morbidly obese who have, have diabetes. And so I can write a thousand word article about it, or I can actually just demonstrate it and get people you know, hooked into the interaction of you know, sort of flipping through it. Uh, this is another looking at healthcare costs uh, by age. So this is the, uh, the angle of the wedge is the relative uh, number of people with a particular condition. Uh, the area of the wedge is the overall cost for that condition. So at age 50, hypertension is a big one. Uh, back towards age 18, not so much. It's actually asthma. Um, and so we can actually just, you know, just play with the data in a very fluid way um, to see what's, what's in that data set. Uh, and then most recently, this is one looking at um, aging populations. So uh, each of these bars represents people of age. Uh, so here it's, you know, zero to five, sorry, zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, and so on. So the fascinating thing is that Japan basically has this enormous cohort of people who are aged 60 to 64, and over the next couple years, um, what does that actually mean for their economy, their healthcare system? So here we are going through the next couple years. Um, and we actually want to, you know, how do we actually tell that, that story with that, that information? Um, we can actually just play this back or actually look at it just straight from 1950 all the way through 2050. Um, over at the right, we have this composite. We can uh, you know, flip between different countries here and so on. Um, this is uh, also online. This is uh, healthyimagination.com. Um, and we've been doing you know, projects like this to basically, you know, how can you, um, you know, work with and try and understand some of this data? Uh, more recently, I've been working on, uh, working for Google to actually look at uh, how we can get the processing software to run on, uh, or actually be able to create things for Android devices. Um, so this is actually the same, the same piece, uh, just up and running uh, on Android. Uh, here's the, uh, the, the cost piece. Um, you know, everything kind of changes on mobile, and so uh, you have to do a good bit of, you know, sort of move things around, and, you know, how do, you, how do people actually interact with it, and so on. Um, we can talk about that some more later. Uh, and then finally, um, on the more, you know, back to the more complicated end of the scale. So, uh, you know, back to the genetics uh, work that I showed, here's a, uh, a browser of the entire human genome. So uh, actually running on a uh, Google uh, Nexus One phone. So, um, and this just works. So 
all three billion letters of you know, human DNA, all 20, 25,000 genes, um, and you can actually just you know, scan through it on a uh, mobile device. And this is, um, you know, which is sort of an astonishing thing as far as, you know, like right now it's an expensive you know, sort of phone, but this is you know, quickly becoming the norm. It'll be a, you know, $100 in a couple years. Um, what does that mean for, A, the type of data that we can actually carry around, you know, much less B, sort of the healthcare side of um, what you know, health information can we actually take, uh, take along with us and have as a, um, uh, something mobile that just actually exists in our pocket that um, is owned by us. So with that, I will close, and uh, thanks very much.